Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. My podcast this week is a bit unique in that we will be discussing how to diagnose deficiencies in cannabis and how to use a dichotomous key. We have a new document available on our website at www. KISorganics.com. Just click on the learn tab and then blog and it will be the first post. Uh, This will have the dichotomous key that we reference in the podcast as well as images showing the deficiencies related to each mineral we discuss. So if you wanted to follow along to the podcast with visuals, you can check it out on the website anytime as a free guide. My guest this week is Brandon Hudson. Brandon is a second generation cannabis cultivator with over 35 years of direct experience with this amazing plant. Growing up in East Tennessee with the Great Smoky Mountains for a backyard, Brandon can't remember a time that he didn't love the outdoors. His parents grew row crops and were advocates of the 1970s back to the land movement. Building on fundamentals learned as a child, Brandon has applied a controlled approach to cannabis cultivation starting with his first plants his freshman year of college in 1986. He currently works for Kiss Organics, providing growers with everything from customer support to assistance with nutrients and soil tests. A well-rounded and passionate organic grower, Brandon's real passion is in soil chemistry. Recently, Brandon was the Director of Cultivation and one of the four founding members of a minority-owned hemp flower farm in South Carolina. He provided SOPs and oversight for all aspects of cultivation from propagation to harvest and cure, including daily operation of a large nursery facility. In this role, Brandon also performed several federally funded hemp trials for HBCUs as well as research projects for nutrient producers. He also worked with a group to develop sterile gels for propagation. Anyone who has met Brandon knows he is rarely as happy as when he is talking plants with other passionate growers. He is a proud dad and husband who spends his free time outdoors with his veggie gardens and chickens. Now on to the show. Hey Brandon, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Tad. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, let's start off telling growers a little bit about you and uh, go from there. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Anybody that knows me has been victimized by my chatty. Keep me on track if I, if I go off script here, but, um, I grew up in East Tennessee, Smoky mountains with a twin brother and little sister. And we spent all of our childhood uh, running around in the woods. And that's a theme I hear with a podcast interviews actually is it seems like everybody that that is on this same track has always had some kind of passion or, or love for plants. Um, our parents were hippies um, in the seventies, the whole back to the earth, back to the land movement. So they were, they were growing row crops and my mom was canning and pickling. So we grew up in the fields and um, my mom's my real plant. And yes, she's uh, she was a professional horticulturalist for many years and maintained beautiful floral gardens uh, still in Tennessee. Uh, she has a little sister for Evergreen in Virginia, the um, Carter family folds nurse. And she's got some funny stories about cussing out Johnny Cash for parking his bus where she needed to move soil and stuff like that. Um, but so I've always been around hippies and plants. And, um, so when I got into college and uh, got into um, uh, Grateful Dead and uh, that community um, really came full circle back into my life because my dad grew, uncles grew, you know, my my entire family, they're that era, they're that age where they were age in the 70s and, you know, they all, they all smoked and uh, it really wasn't a uh, big deal. And then uh, in the 80s, you know, that's the height of the Just Say No era everybody kind of took it underground and got quiet about it. And so it really wasn't on my radar again in college. And then, um, you know, it's like salt and pepper for deadheads. So it goes thing and just became a big part of my life. And immediately I was attracted to wanting to grow it. And, um, you know, Ed Rosenthal has that great quote about how 
it's an addictive, but growing it is, and I, I would have to concur with that wholeheartedly. And then, you know, so I, I started trying, and I had a, a little astronomy knowledge. Um, I, my first attempt uh, home, and my mom had found it, um, and so the dead plants and <laughs> the light my bed. And so uh, 35 years later, you know, I just kept at it, kept at it. and uh, back in those days, you know, you had a couple of books by Ed Rosen, there's the Robert Connell Clark books, and, you know, my dad had a bunch of um, undergrow, uh, underground growing books, um, but back then you couldn't even take notes, you know, it was just really scary, and um, I, at Ohio State, I met a guy at a party, uh, I was actually hanging out with some friends, and a guy came in, and super straight and everybody got really nervous and my buddy started laughing and was like that's the brought the the real g13 and so if anybody knows the the g13 history that was coming out of dayton um i i got to meet that guy at a party and um he he kind of opened some doors for me you know it was really hard to get lighting it was really hard to get a solid grip on fertilizer regimens and that kind of stuff back in those days. And he sent me to a florist, a traditional or not a florist, but a traditional uh, cultivation store. And I went in, not like a hydro store or anything. I went in and it looked like a mom and pop place. I was kind of nervous to say anything, but I went up to the counter and said, you know, his, his password name was Bobby Brady because he, he literally looked like Bobby Brady from the Brady bunch. And as soon as I told him that they, that Bobby Brady had sent me, they um, sent a hippie looking kid out who took me into a back room and showed me a bunch of grow lights. And um, that was, that was where I really got some of the basics and um, just kept, kept at it. And those guys really knew their thing. They, they were uh, conscious of IPM. They, they knew lighting, they knew how to cure. They were, they were really ahead of their time. And so it was just really lucky to, to meet those guys and, um, got the uh, opportunity eventually to run a commercial facility in South Carolina for four and a half, five years doing hemp flower on scale, um, knocking out 20,000 cuttings at a time. So, you know, just really got to um, fine tune everything from propagation to, um, to harvest and, and cure on scale. And so that was a really great experience for me. Got to work with a lot of, you know, local organic farms, um, got to do some, uh, hemp trials for, a, a HBCU in the state. And, um, then, uh, eventually got to work at Kiss Organics with you guys. And so that's where I am now and I'm helping clients and doing soil reports and, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, well, we're excited to have you, and you bring a lot of experience to the table. And I wanted to um, sort of start off the podcast talking about this idea of, from a grower's perspective, how how do you approach a grow? I know you and I have had a conversation about this, um, you know, talking about limiting factors. Can you kind of uh, delve into that a little bit? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And, and and that's one of the things I do is answer a lot of calls from, you know, not just beginning growers, but growers who are getting exposed to scale as cannabis has become legalized. And there's a lot of folks coming into it without a strong traditional agronomy background. And um, so to to approach things on scale, it's really important, I think, to start with, a you know, a list of limiting factors. You know, there's always going to be your weak link, and that's going to be the thing that's slowing you down. You know, and it's, agronomy is so um, interesting and so uh, just infinitely interesting because it's not a closed system. There's, you know, interactions with all the different phases and interactions with all the different uh, limiting factors. And, you know, you've got your your par your ppfd range your relative humidity you know what's your water quality your irrigation events you know how 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 do you water you, you know what's the temp um ipm pests viruses you know cannabis growers are 
unfortunately inf- uh, infamous for passing around viruses and um, uh, insects. And so, you know, I think that the community has has is, is getting a lot better about that, and people are starting to really understand that quarantining and even things like tissue control and that kind of stuff are really important. But, you know, you, ha- you have to kind of dial in a metric for each one of those limiting factors, and nutrients is one of them. Um, and so we're lucky that, you know, well, it's not a closed system, like I said, in controlled ag, controlled cultivation, environmentally controlled agri- agriculture, we can control a lot of the limiting factors. And so we can, um, you know, optimize our production, you know, always looking at, at margins and, and, you know, input costs and, with one eye and, you know, per, you know, your final harvest with the, with the other eye. But, you know, we're, we're able to optimize our, our growth because we can control a lot of those things. And so for me as a, an organic grower, the tricky thing is the nutrients in your soil and, you know, or, organics, it's it's only been in the last 10, 15 years, you know, but really 10 years where we've been able to, uh, you know, get a basic NPK value for, for an input and that sort of thing. And um, so it's made it really tricky for growers to be 100% confident that they've got all the nutrients in that soil that they need, you know, and, and so that's why, you know, I know you do. I I do. I I live and die by soil reports. But as an experienced grower, I think it's really important that you can you can physically, visually ID your plants. You know, you can't you can't test you can't afford to test every single plant in a twelve thousand square foot greenhouse. You can't do that. And so you need to be able to read it visually and determine if you've got you know environmental issues, pest issues pathogen issues, uh, watering issues, nutrients, you know, and, and dial those, dial those things in. But if you can visually recognize them, you can, you can get ahead of them before it becomes a, a problem. Yeah. So this, this podcast in particular is going to be focused on, uh, nutrients and limiting factors with nutrients. But from a grower perspective, I think it's important. Um, and I know when I go out and do con- consultations and things, I- I'm putting on like a detective's hat. And essentially, I'm trying to figure out what's the current limiting factor of growth. Because there's always something that's going to be limiting the plant. Um, you know, like you mentioned, it could be light, it could be pests, it could be nutrients, it could be watering, it can be all of those, any one of those things. So uh, as a grower, what I want to do is eliminate as many variables as I can and then figure out which variable, focus on one variable, the one that I think is the one that's probably most key to, um, you know, eliminating the, the lowest hanging fruit, essentially what the limiting factor is. And then once that's corrected, there'll be a new limiting factor that I'm looking at. So maybe initially, uh, for example, it's the way that I'm watering. I'm, I'm overwatering, I'm leaching nutrients, I'm stressing the plant and killing root hairs. Um, so once that's corrected, well, now I find that maybe my light levels are a little bit lower than they could be to be optimized. And so now I'm focused on raising my light levels. And then after that, it may be something else. So you're, you're always going through this process. And from a nutrient perspective, something that you and I have talked a bit about quite a bit off air is if we're trying to diagnose a nutrient problem, um, and we know that it is indeed nutrients, it goes beyond uh, just a soil test. So we can't just take a soil test and know everything that we need to know about a particular soil. Um, we, we need to have a conversation with the grower. We need to know how do the plants actually look because um, there are all these variables and genetics is one of the biggest ones there. And certain plants um, that people are growing are going to be more sensitive to nitrates, for example, or might need slightly more phosphorus. So there is no standard calculator that we can use that's going to give us optimal fertility. It can definitely point us in the right direction, but it really is that conversation with the grower or that the grower needs to have with themselves to really figure out what's optimal for the particular plants in, in their environment. Um, so I just want people to start thinking about that. And then as we start narrowing it down, 
then eliminating variables, like I mentioned. So um, going back to just using water, you know, and clean water, um, rather than have adding all of these other teas or KNF products, because I know, sorry, and I'm almost done here. <laughs> I know people will think like, okay, I want to get into KNF. And so I'm going to start doing water soluble calcium. But you need to take a step back and say, does my plant actually need that calcium? If the soil is already high in calcium, well, we may be compounding an already existing problem by raising pH, by limiting other cations. Um, so it's sort of that conversation that growers need to have in their heads or with a professional to really dial in uh, their cultivation process. So that's I, ju I just wanted to share a little bit about that. But let's go into um, what a diachotomous key is and, and start talking about, uh, you know, these, these nutrients and how they might display on a given plant. So uh, yeah, talk to me about yeah. that. So I'll just, before we jump into that, I just want to echo again what you just said about it's really important to take that holistic approach. There is no one, you know, as somebody who lives and dies by soil reports, I still know that there's there's no one calculator or you know there's no way to just put your numbers into a, into a spreadsheet and, and kick out what you need and like calcium's a, a a favorite of mine you know look at you know you can have tons of calcium in your soil and your relative humidity is too high and you're not going to have any in your tissue and so there's there's such a um, you, you really do have to take that holistic thousand foot view and look at all the different factors and see how they, you know, what's your target for that factor? How close are to you, are, are you to that target? And then what you can do to, you know, move incrementally towards that. Um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to touch back on that. But as far as a dichotomous key, um, one of the really big, you know, like I said, I've, I've got 35, 36 years of active, um, experience with cultivating that plant, um, you are going to invariably start to learn, you know, this is what wind burn on the, on a leaf looks like, or, you know, all the different environmental and nutritional issues that you can run, run into. You'll start to just know those, um, just year after year after year. Um, but trying to teach, you know, when I, when I got to the hemp farm and I had people working for me, and I wanted them to be able to scout and um, trying to teach somebody 35 years of memorization, it just doesn't work well. And so I, I really wanted a, a, a path that somebody could follow to make a decision and feel comfortable about it, that they were, they were dealing with a, a nutrient issue that they could narrow down. And so a dichotomous key is just, you know, a, I think everybody's used one in high school biology or on a field guide, but it basically gives you a, a question and you can go one, one direction or the other, depending on, on the answer. And it, just a quick scouting note, um, you know, if, if it is suspected that you've got a pest or a pathogen, um, you really first step is crucial is getting that ID'd you know, having, having the right scopes and that kind of stuff to do that. Um, but regular scouting and knowing where your nutrient issue starts on your plant is, is crucial. Um, but when you first approach a, a canopy, you know, um, a quadrant, a, a cultivar, and that's one of the issues I see is, you know, in, in, You'll, you'll see somebody's canopy and they'll have a certain number of plants of this cultivar and a certain number of these. And you can't really treat those as one canopy. You need to look at each cultivar as a canopy to, to look for nutrient issues. But on a, a dichotomous key, as far as nutrients, the first thing, you know, you've got a symptom on a plant. A plant doesn't look good. It doesn't look healthy. And the first thing you need to determine is, is that a nutrient issue or is it something else? You know, so it's either biotic, you know, something living, think pests and pathogens, or it's abiotic, and then you've got either a nutrient or an environmental issue. And so when you're looking at, you know, a specific cultivar or a specific 
area of your um, your canopy, you want to see if you're seeing patterns. And if you're seeing um, a, a, you know, an entire area affected, you most likely have an abiotic issue. You know, if it's if it's across the board, if you have you know, one plant's that affected and then it jumps over to another one, you're probably looking at something that's biotic. You've probably got a pest, you know, that's jumped from, you know, one plant, skipped over another one, jumped onto another one. And, you know, unless you've let a, a pest or pathogen problem go way too far, but, uh, you know, hopefully if you're scouting, you would know that. Um, but once you, you know, you've determined if you've got a pattern or not and you can look at an individual plant you know you can look at leaves and you know if if you've got uh, a dead area like a necrotic spot on a plant and it's just on one leaflet on on one leaf grouping then you know that makes me think uh, again that you've got a biotic issue because it's not repeating throughout the entire plant now if you could fold that leaf over and so you've got like a marginal um yellowing or uh, necrosis or chlorosis um, if you've got that along the the edge and that repeats throughout the plant then you're pretty comfortable that you've got a, an abiotic issue it's either your environment or your nutrients and so once you you've determined that you've seen a pattern and you know that you've got an abiotic issue and as a you know a, a controlled grower you should have a, a pretty good idea of your your targets for all of your limiting factors. And as long as you're meeting those, then you can feel pretty comfortable that you're looking at a nutrient issue. And that's where you would want to start making, you know, use of the, the dichotomous key. Really, the first step in the dichotomous key is to determine if it's biotic or abiotic. Then the, the next step would be to, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you really, really need to pay attention to where the nutrient issue started on the plant. Did it start at the bottom, the top, or the whole plant all at once? And the reason that's important is that empowers you to know whether you're dealing with a mobile element or an immobile element. Um, tell me if you want me to take a breath here, but um, I'll, I'll just keep going through this if you like. Um, but it, it, if you are looking at mobile and immobile elements, you know, obviously all elements are going to be mobile. They have to be able to be brought into the plant. But what we're talking about is can it be translocated um, within the plant? And so obviously the most important areas on the plant are the apical points, the, the growing tips and the, the root tips and the, and the shoot tips. And those are, you know, for reproductive reasons and for growth reasons, those are prioritized over the other tissue in the plant. And so if you've got a mobile element, you're going to see that show up on the bottom of your plant because it's going to be sacrificed and translocated to those growing tips to keep them optimally growing. If you have an immobile element, it can't be translocated. And so it's going to show up on those growing tips. And so, um, you know, so something like calcium or phosphorus, you know, where you need it for root development or, you know, um, flower development, you know, you, you'll be able to determine by looking at the symptoms on the plant, which, which ones you're dealing with. And so we could start with the mobile elements. Um, that's a, that's a one that, there's several of those that people are very familiar with. Um, nitrogen, obviously, is the the nutrient issue that we see the most in cannabis. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, you know, especially as you're heading into flower. You, you want to see your nitrogen numbers taper down. And so, you know, that's, that's not really a, a deficiency that we worry about, but that's a good way for a grower to know without a tissue sample that his nitrogen is winding down as they're moving towards flower. But so if you want to go through those mobile nutrients, um, again, we've set it up as a dichotomous key. So, you know, you've decided you've got an abiotic issue. You've decided that the issue is started on the bottom of your plant. So we're going to go with mobile. And so then you want to start looking at visual symptoms. And there's a lot of visual symptoms that um, are going to be similar. And then a note 
as well, usually, you know, like especially like with a pH or a irrigation problem, uh, you're going to see a lot of, of mul- you're going to see multiple symptoms. You're not going to just see one symptom. You know, if, if your roots are damaged, it's not just nitrogen that's not getting into your plant. It's everything. And so that's just a, that's a, a note that can also kind of, if you, you know, if you're seeing a bunch of stuff going, going haywire, you know, check that pH first of all, you know, go, go back to some of the basics. But if you're seeing just some yellowing at the bottom of your plant, um, some chlorosis, everybody's seen that, and that's nitrogen or phosphorus. Um, pretty easy to differentiate those uh, a couple of different ways. Um, if you've got leaf abscission, meaning that if you give the, a, a lower leaf that's yellow, if you give it a little tug or a little snap, it'll pop right off the plant. Or if the leaf is just yellow and falling off, you've got nitrogen issues. If, uh, if the plant is, you know, a dark green and the lower leaf yellowing begins to, you know, go necrotic on the tips and they don't pop off, then you've got phosphorus. You know, another, another phosphorus clue, you know, don't be afraid to pull a plant out of a pot, you know, especially on scale if you're using smaller pots, pop some out and look at those roots. If you've got short clubby roots, you may have a phosphorus issue. Um, you know, and then phosphorus, everybody is always talking about how, um, you know, purpling as a sim sign for phosphorus and sometimes potassium. And I just like to warn folks that that's not always the smoking gun that it might seem to be um, based on cultivar, um, based on temperature, you know, those uh, anthocyanins can build up, sugars can build up. And so there's, there's a lot of things that can make that purpling happen. Um, and so, you know, if, if you've got the chlorosis, on the lower leaves, you're looking at nitrogen or phosphorus, and you know that we've got some ways to determine which one of those. And then, if you were looking at lower leaves and you get the the tiger striping, the, the intervenal chlorosis, you get that lack of pigment between the veins. That's one of the easiest to diagnose. That's magnesium, and the way to prove it to yourself and remedy it is with an Epsom foliar. Obviously, you don't want to spray anything on a, a flowering plant but in veg you can go ahead and and do a, a one tablespoon to one gallon spray and you'll have results within 24 to 48 hours and that's that's a really easy way to know that that was a magnesium issue um, potassium everybody's seen potassium it's the when you're talking about the margin, the edge of the leaf, um, if you see yellowing chlorosis, chlorosis coming in on the margins and then quickly going to necrosis, you've got, you know, as a band, not just the tips, um, but as a band along the edge of the leaf, it's uh, really, really solid evidence that you're dealing with a potassium issue. Um, and again, that's, you know, once you've scouted and eliminated pests and that sort of thing, but that, that gives you a really easy way to see the bottom of the plant and those mobile elements. Can um, I partially mobile? Can I yeah. jump in real quick, Brandon? So uh, two thoughts I had. The first was with potassium. The other clue I see is when I talk to a grower and they're like, "Man, my plant looks really good, but it's I've run this cultivar before and it's just I'm just not getting that like bulking density that I normally see in flower." Usually, when I see a soil test associated with that. Um, we find low potassium. So that's an easy, easy, easy kind of clue also to watch for with, uh, with potassium. I just want to mention that. Um, no, I, I agree a hundred percent and you and I differ a little bit. I push, I push potassium a little bit higher than a lot of growers do. And the reason, um, is I, I feel like you get, uh, a, a, a payoff at harvest for sure. So I, I'm, on board with that a hundred percent. Yeah. I think a lot of this, the PK boosters in, uh, that are marketed in the cannabis industry, it's really the K that's the driver there more than the P in terms of finishing flowers. Um, so I, w- I would agree with you there. Um, so yeah, calcium and potassium, I think are the, the real secret to, to strong flower production. And I think that, um, 
phosphorus. Well, we could get into the whole, <laughs> we could get into that whole uh, rabbit hole some other time. But, but yeah, I totally agree. So as um, I'm, I'm following along here on your, uh, on the blog post, uh, and folks can do that as well. I'll, I'll talk about this at the beginning of the podcast. But um, what about for a canopy where you've removed a lot of your lower leaves? Because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you've trellised your plant. Um, what do you use for clues when you don't have as many, you don't have that lower canopy as, you know, to, to look at as, I guess, as much? Yeah, so it's it's obviously a very common practice to, um, you know, uh, before flip, before flowering, um, there's a bunch of different names for it, you know, colloquially, you know, people, we call it lollipopping, but basically you trim out the bottom of the plant. And so you're going to remove a lot of your um, your lower leaves, obviously, and that's a good practice. You know, it's going to open up airflow and it's going to limit the number of budding sites and so that you can get a more marketable product and that sort of thing. But um, my experience has always been that if you have a nutrient deficiency, um, the lower leaves on your plant, regardless of where, almost like a, thinking about it in terms of a perched water table, it doesn't really matter where you move it, it's just going to be there. I see the, the leaf symptoms happening in those bottom most leaves. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, that's what I was getting at. So if you've removed, let's say, the bottom eight inches of the, of the plant and all those leaves, then essentially your nitrogen deficiency, if it's showing up, would start, or your phosphorus on, would start with whatever that bottom leaf is, even if it's eight inches up um, at exactly. where your canopy starts. So, yeah, I just kind of wanted to get that into the podcast. So, Yeah, the, the minimum canopy of, I, I ever see is a 12-inch canopy, you know, and that's still enough to give you um, lower leaf leaves that you could use for you know, visually you know, sleuthing out a, a symptom. Now, uh, I want to let you keep going through this, but I see a lot of people online talking about uh, or, or having trouble distinguishing between calcium and magnesium in terms of leaf damage. Um, could you maybe touch on a little bit on how to distinguish the two? Oh, and I would add that you can also do a soil drench with Epsom salt. Um, since you'd mentioned the foliar, right. you can also yep. do that yep. as a salt drench. But yeah, can you can you talk a little bit about that? Which is great for flour. Yeah, yeah. So um, calcium and magnesium. Um, calcium deficiencies um, in in substrate growing is 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 something that I, I see a lot, and there's a lot of different ways that you can have a calcium deficiency. Like I mentioned earlier, like you can have plenty of calcium in your soil. Um, but because it travels primarily in the xylem, if your transpiration rates are messed up, you know, high relative humidity, um, something like that, you won't get it into the tissue. Calcium and magnesium, um, differ in that magnesium is going to show up on the bottom of the plant versus calcium on the top of the plant. So that's one of the the, the easiest ways, uh, magnesium is famous for that intravenal chlorosis, uh, the tiger striping, but again, at the bottom. So you can get some of that intravenal chlorosis uh, with, with calcium, but it would be up at the top of the plant. And where I see calcium issues on plants, I see uh, necrosis and distortion I see, uh, you know, calcium is responsible for the structure. And so if you don't have it, like, you know, in tomatoes, blossom in rot or apples, you get apple scab. And what that is, it's just a, a lack of calcium. And so you've got a weak cell structure. Um, you know, so anybody who's grown like a, a cultivar they've used, they're used to, and then the next, the next round, if they're low on calcium, they'll get almost like this viney growth. It'll get really long and it can't support itself. And then come flower, you've got lower flower. And the even though that it's lowered flower, it, they can't support the weight of themselves. They're just kind of falling all over the place. Um, so calcium, I also... Oh, no, go oh, ahead. I was just going to add, it looks like... Um, and, and I'm referencing also between sort of our 
Dichotomous Key, the one that you put together and we're offering, also in conjunction mm-hmm. with Paul Coxon's paper. Um, I've yep. had Paul on the podcast. People should definitely check that out. It's called Characterization of Nutrient Disorders of Cannabis Sativa. And, uh, you know, from looking at his photos, it also appears that uh, calcium starts more at the base of the leaf, whereas magnesium, you get a more of a intervenal corrosis across the entire leaf um, based on his Yeah, that's photos. another tale. Yeah, that's another telltale sign that you can use is, you know, where exactly did that, you know, chlorosis start? If you've got it more on the tip um, or on the little serrations along the margin up top, immediately I'm going to start thinking um, calcium. But if I've got like, if I've got tan speckling, um, larger areas, um, I might be dealing with uh, manganese up top, you know, and then calcium is kind of famous for that windburned look where the the edges are going to go necrotic on you as well. Um, Iron, one of its telltale signs is, you know, iron you can kind of see sometimes throughout the entire plant, but typically it starts up top and I think everybody's seen it and maybe just not even recognized what it is. But when somebody contacts me about, young plants especially and they're like you know my plants look really healthy but they're they're always the new growth is always like really light towards the petiole end of the leaf and that's iron usually so you know knowing where it starts on the plant but then also on the leaf can help you dial in what nutrients you're dealing with can iron look like light bleaching Iron can, iron can actually go, you know, that's one of the the symptoms of iron and especially in um, some row crops like grapes and things like that. If you have an iron issue, it can go all the way to white, you know, so it'll start off as chlorotic looking, you know, pale lime green, and then it goes chlorotic, turns yellow. But then if you've got a serious iron issue, it can look like bleaching, um, just because it, it, the tips will go white, um, you know, whole leaves will go white, that you, you would have to have a pretty severe iron deficiency. But I see it. I definitely see it. You know, iron's another one that's hard to, you know, without chelators and, you know, that sort of thing, you know, without humics and fulvics, and you can have iron issues, especially at, at low pH, you know. So, so when diagnosing a plant, um, what, what you're saying essentially is it's really important to not only have a, a photo or, or, or take a close look at the, a leaf itself, but also look at where that leaf is located on the plant and also have a photo of the entire plant. So like, there's no way a person could really, I, I would say effectively diagnose a plant off of just one photo of a leaf, um, on a forum, for example. Because yeah, I, I see exactly. people post a picture of a leaf all the time, and then you know everyone writes cow meg or whatever, <laughs> you know, they think they think it might <laughs> yeah, be. It happens band-aid. all the time. Yeah, but um, this idea then is that we really need to see the entire plant, and then also know um, where on that leaf or where on that plant that plant was the the leaf was located to really start dialing in what the limiting factor is, what the nutrient deficiency is. Exactly. The f- the first thing I ask somebody, you know, when somebody contacts me and says, I've got a plant and it has a, an issue, the first thing I do is I send them a little questionnaire about limiting factors. You know, what is your your lighting? What is your temperature? What is your water? And I, I ask a bunch of questions. They're usually not expecting to get questions back to their question, but it really helps us dial it in. And then I want photos and I want photos of the entire plant. You know, if it's on, if it's a on scale canopy, I, I'd like to see photos of the canopy so I can look for patterns and, you know, it's really difficult to discern this stuff in person. So discerning it, you know, from photos like Suzanne, you know, if you send her a, a grainy photo of what might be an aphid and ask, ask for help, um, you're not going to get, um, you're going to get scolded. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get your, well, you're going to learn something. And, um, and that's to, to take really good, precise images because that's, that's how you empower that person to help you. And so if, if somebody can 
you know, note first and foremost where on the planet started. And then, you know, within that issue, you know, did it start at the petiole, you know, closest to the stem or did it start on the tip? Um, you know, those are really important to help us guide what the issue is because we're we're trying to determine what the issue is without being able to scope without being able to have tissue without being able to have soil reports and you know we really want to do the best we can for folks and then set them up for success so it really it really comes down to the more information they can give us the better job we can do figuring out what their issue is and one of the keys I would say or, or clues is if you have a soil report that shows that you have sufficiency of nutrients in that soil, you've used good inputs to know that you have good biology in there that's going to cycle the nutrients, Then, and, and your plant still doesn't look the way you want it to, well then at that point, it, it, for me, it's usually pretty clear that it's probably a watering issue. Um, one of the things that Don Marshall talked about in his podcast that I like to remind folks of is that... Um, like just how important watering is and when you over or under water you're having the same effect in the plant in that you're killing root hairs and when you kill root hairs the plant does not have the ability to uptake nutrients uh, to the same effect that it would have uh, prior to that to the root hair death so it can display deficiencies even if there is sufficient nutrients in the soil so um that that's one of the first places I like to start when the talking about deficiencies is make sure that the watering is, is correct and you're not massively over under watering um, because you can apply all the nutrients in the world from an organic perspective and they just won't be available to the plant until we correct the watering. Yeah, that that's, there's an old greenhouse adage that the most important person in the greenhouse is the person holding the hose. And I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, that's the first thing, you know, when I would bring somebody on and, and start working them into, you know, a workflow, that's the first thing I would do with them. And a lot of people would, you know, kind of feel uh, insulted. You know, I would, I would give them a, a water hose and a, and a, with a dram breaker, you know, water breaker head on it and explain the importance of that. You know, you get good flow and you're not compacting the soil and blah blasting spores up into the air and that kind of stuff. But then they would expect me to just cut them loose. And I would spend weeks standing there with them, watching them water, you know, uh, enormous canopies. And it's because it is the single most important thing. And I don't care what style of cultivation, what form of nutrients you're applying. If you are not watering appropriately, you are definitely going to have issues that's the number one the number one uh, reason for lost crops in greenhouse growing is is irrigation issues and uh, not pests not pathogens uh, it's operator error and uh, yeah so getting your water dialed in and really knowing your 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 water and in the same way that you're saying take you know if you have if you've armed yourself with a soil report and you and you notice a nutrient issue that's something that becomes experience and you know that and so if you are monitoring your water you know and most organic growers are growing in larger smart pots or raised beds so that they have a bigger ecosystem that can keep up with the plant's needs it's pretty easy to put a you know a, like a blue mat water sensor or you know or you know shouldn't shouldn't say brands but just you know if you have a, a water meter that, that you can you know uh with a ceramic tip with that you know it's going to measure that osmotic pressure and you you'll be able to dial in you know at this at this millibar metric my plants are absolutely in heaven you know and if i go this direction they don't like it and so data you know it, it's all about data and and being able to associate those visual clues back to that data so what are some ways to, like you mentioned with uh, magnesium, for example, Epsom salts, uh, an easy way to see a visual change. Um, let's talk about a little bit about that process. So let's say we know that we are low in a particular mineral. How do we go about, you know, once, we, once we've once we done the diagnosis, we know we're not, uh, you know, causing a big issue with our irrigation practices. How do we go about correcting a, a nutrient issue or mineral issue? 
So there's a, there's a couple of different ways you can go. There's a bunch of different ways you can go about it, obviously. Um, but first and foremost, you just said you, you've diagnosed an issue. And so in, you know, what's, what's the important thing that you do in all scientific experiments, you have a control. And so if you want to verify for yourself that you have figured out what the issue is and that you can correct it, you know, you want to add that nutrient, that element. And so, you know, when it's dealing with trace elements, um, sometimes it's better just to add a kind of one and done uh, amendment, you know, something that like glacial uh, rock dust or something that's going to, or kelp that's got a bunch of trace uh, minerals in it, as opposed to trying to put that one trace element back in there, because that's, that's really touchy. And a lot of times you can do more damage trying to add an individual trace element back in. So I, I, I don't go that route with, with the trace elements, but with my micros and macros, you know, it's really easy to get, um, you know, a, a sulfate of just about anything. And you can, you, you know, you can add that back in. And then for your, your, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, um, I would add, you know, a specific amendment, usually something at, you know, fine particle size with a lot of surface area that's more soluble. Um, you know, if you're suspecting, Something like phosphorus, make sure you've got phosphorus solubilizing uh, bacteria in your in your beds, in your pots. You know, like you're saying, you know, you want to make sure that it's whatever it is is available, um, and that that requires uh, you know your microbes in your soil to to get to work. Um, so that that would be the approach. It would be to you know once once you've determined whatever element it is, you want to add that particular element, and then wait for a response. And some are faster than others. You know, like that magnesium response is really fast. Um, uh, phosphorus or potassium is a little slower reaction usually. Um, you know, calcium usually responds pretty pretty quickly um, to a to a foliar and veg, and then you know, ag lime as opposed to, you know, something slow releasing. And um, so that's, that's the approach. Does that, does yeah, that answer? So um, just to give some people some suggestions, like with calcium, you mentioned ag lime, which is uh, very soluble, works great. It can raise your pH, um, will add carbonates. So it, you have to kind of think about a lot of different things when deciding what to add. Um, gypsum, there's some water soluble gypsum, calcium sulfate, um, that it works really well in a lot of cases too. Um, when I think of potassium, if I need it late in flower and I need it quickly, there's some, uh, really good potassium sulfate options, zero, zero 50. Um, so it's going to give you a lot of potassium, uh, and you can water that in, you know, really easily to a flowering crop. Um, I, I think nitrogen and phosphorus are a little more complicated from an organic perspective, but there's some options there too. Uh, phosphorus is the hardest to manage. I feel like, well, it's phosphorus, you know, and this is, this is where some people may have issue, but, um, uh, fish hydrolysate is stabilized with phosphoric acid, which is a very available form of, of phosphorus. Um, interestingly enough, we just saw a soil test where, the uh, grower had been using uh, phosphoric acid in their greenhouse to lower the pH of their water. And we saw off the charts available phosphorus, like numbers that I hadn't seen before. Uh, and, and the grower had just switched from using sulfuric acid. So um, that was very obvious on the soil test. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, so that's a very available source of phosphorus too, depending on, um, you know, what you're comfortable using and if it makes sense in your grow, but just knowing, I think, I think being educated as a grower as to how available these nutrients are, um, is also an important part of, of this whole dichotomous key process for, you know, correcting any issue you may have, because like you mentioned, if I have an issue with calcium and I'm, you know, midway through flower and I put out granulated gypsum and water that in, well, I may not be getting 
a noticeable effect in, in raising calcium for the plant um, in a timely fashion. So that, that's definitely important. Yeah, I think that um, folks have to make those decisions, like with the phosphorus workaround. You know, it's really important that people know that that's an option and you can maintain, a, you know, an a OMRI certification if, if you do that because it, it, it has to be in there to stabilize the fish, you know. So there are, there are we workarounds on certain things and it really just comes down to um, what you're comfortable with and your goals as far as, you know, how close you can move to sustainability. You know, that, I think that's the ultimate goal. Um, I would like to put in a note right here um, on those same lines. You know, you're saying, what should I add? Uh, the worst thing that somebody can add is um, shotgun approach, where they start throwing a bunch of different things at it. And the absolute worst thing they could do is use an unknown product. The, the product I see people using the most and causing the most problems is very well intentioned but i see a lot of folks that top dress with local compost and by local compost i mean compost that they produced or a friend produced um something that has not been tested for its nutrients uh hasn't been tested for pest pathogens pests and pathogens something that hasn't been tested for um you know seed and weed it's just it's just some compost that somebody made and it, it looks good. It's brown and it looks good. It smells good, but it could have heavy metals. It could have incredibly high sodium levels. It could have, you know, um, there's all kinds of issues. And so one thing that I, I really encourage people to do is, you know, if, if you see an issue, you can, you can contact me. You, you can contact me and I'm not going to charge you anything. <laughs> I'm just, I, I love plants. I'm super curious. We want everybody to be as well armed and um, uh, as empowered in their garden as they can be. And so if somebody can contact me and say, Hey, I've got this issue. I'm thinking about adding this. We can tell them, Oh, that's a great idea. Or I could tell them, you know, you might want to look at this option might work a little bit better for you. This could cause an antagonism. So, you know, you could throw, you know, you could start with one problem and create a lot more problems by using unknown products. So, um, just, yeah. And you know, I, I want to add to you, like, you know, a phosphoric acid is not the only way to raise P. Um, I don't like guanos, but they work too. Um, but one of the things that we've had good success with is, uh, and you know, we talked about not naming brands, but mammoth pea and having something, uh, like you mentioned that pea solubilizing, uh, microbes is, is a good way to make that pea more available to the plant. So, um, that's definitely a good option. And if you wanted to stay fully organic, um, mm -hmm. is another consideration. And I didn't want to make it sound like, I don't want to make it sound like, um, it's hard to get, it's not hard to get phosphorus into the soil it's harder to get it available to plants that's where it's tricky and and using something like the mammoth pea eliminates that issue it, it'll it'll keep it in sufficiency for you throughout the the full term of your plant yeah and then the other thing i just want to touch on is as a soil producer ourselves um you know from time to time we do see people that are having is issues and uh, what I like to do is, is go through this process that the one we just talked about with the grower. Um, but there's things that we know about our soil because we've, we've seen so many soil tests of our, of our soil. I know that as a grower in a small container, the first things that you're going to run out of is nitrogen and potassium. I just, I, I just know that. And that's all it makes sense too, because this, this more mobile, we tend to ha be sufficient in phosphorus and calcium, um, even in a slightly smaller container. Now, one of the things you mentioned is that a larger container just offers more buffering capacity. We can only fit so much nutrients into a given volume of soil, and that corrects a lot of the issues um, right there, just going into a larger volume or a larger container. But contacting your soil provider um, it is a good resource for you too, because um, like I said, Brandon and myself and, and, and Ben will work with a grower to sort of figure out what, um, what's going on. And, um, you know, any soil provider should be able to offer you that same service. So 
you know, I don't know what some of these other commercial soils may be high or low in relative to, say, our soil, but I know pretty well how our soil will perform in a variety of different conditions um, just because of all the tests I've seen and we've been doing this for so long. So I just want to suggest that to folks as a resource that they should absolutely be utilizing. Um, and, you know, every every company should provide you with a soil test, heavy metals, you know, organic certification, whatever sort of information you need to make the right decision about your garden. Um, it's just part of part of offering soil, in my opinion, commercially. So I uh, just want to throw that out there. Uh, anything, anything else you want to add, Brandon? No, I just, uh, I, I love what you just said and um, about what, you know, we're here to help and, and help people move towards sustainability. And, um, you know, if, if you need a resource, you know, like you said, with the soil reports, um, we've seen so many of them and under, you know, so if somebody says they think that they're seeing a magnesium deficiency and I know that they're running uh, LEDs, then I've seen, you know, certain number of soil reports where magnesium is low in flower with certain brands of LEDs even. And so there's, there's just, there's so many correlations and, and relationships to environment and nutrient uptake and, you know, with, you know, what, close to 90 years of prohibition, we're, we're now able to, to gather data. We, we can write things down. You know, that's the, the old joke in the lab is the difference between science and screwing around is writing it down on a piece of paper, but we can do that now. And so, you know, um, take advantage, take advantage of people who've been doing this, ask them questions, you know, make sure you're getting qualified answers. Don't, um, I'm not knocking forums. Forums are uh, a great way to exchange information and, um, pick other people's brains and two heads are always better than one, but, you know, just make sure that both those heads, um, are, are grounded in, in, uh, standard scientific practices and, you know, can, can give you action steps based on data, you know, as opposed to just a gut instinct kind of thing. Cause that's where you can get in trouble. Yeah. Well, you go on a forum and you post a question and you'll get 30 different answers. Um, and, and they'll all fight to the <laughs> they'll death. They'll all be right. different. I know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I guess you get what you pay for with forums and there's some, you know, there's some forums I'm in that have some very uh, intelligent people. I know Suzanne, for mm -hmm. example, will answer bug questions on occasion in some of the forums that I'm in. And, um, at that point you can take that as, uh, as gold, but rarely do I see that. And, um, so yeah, I guess you get what you pay for with forums. Um, they can definitely give you a new perspective, but, uh, you still at the end of the day are the one who is responsible and liable for your plants. And so you have to make the decisions based off of, uh, good information. Yeah. And with that in mind, since you're the one responsible, especially for on scale growers, you know, if you have a stockholder that you have to answer to, don't ever apply a new product to your crop, apply it to, you know, to a test. And if things go well, then you can start, you know, apply it to two plants, you know, but don't, don't ever jump with both feet into a new process or a new product. Um, just, you know, protect yourself and, and ease into it, do, do a control, make sure that you know what the, what limiting factors you can lock in and find that one that you're trying to adjust and, and, you know, make an incremental change. You know, um, you can always, you can always go in at half strength and see what happens, you know, you know, especially with experiments. So I think that's sound advice. All right. Well, uh, thanks for all your time today, Brandon, for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, folks will be able to check out this dichotomous key on the website. Uh, we'll also put a link to Paul's paper available too. That's freely available for folks. And uh, hopefully these will be good resources for people moving forward. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to talk to you. And um, I, I hope it can help some growers. And if they need clarification or or help, they can reach out to me at KISS.
that was Brandon Hudson, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. If you like the podcast, please leave us a rating and review and give us a follow on Instagram. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website homepage to stay up to date on the latest research and information. Thanks for listening.